Welcome to the Etobicoke Lakeshore Podcast. Have you heard enough from us lately? We sure are podcasting a lot, uh, but that's because we're trying to keep everybody in the loop. It's a community thing. Hi, I'm Mike. There's Roger Tumanieri. He's the publisher of the Etobicoke Lakeshore Press. Hi, Roger. Hello, Mike. How's it going, buddy? Excellent. Thank you. Everybody here is uh, healthy and happy, and we're just making the best of this situation. Oh, that's good. I noticed today you're in the kitchen. I am podcasting from the kitchen today. Yes. I, I tend to move around the house, keep my wife guessing. Yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> <Where's> <laughs> no one knows where I am. I got a, <laughs> I got a shot here at uh, keeping the background quiet. I like that you're hiding in closets and stuff from your family. Oh, We're yeah. only a few days into this, really. <laughs> I'll be Come podcasting on. from the truck pretty soon. <laughs> I've had to do that. Don't kid yourself. I have had to do that in the process of doing this. Uh, Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, Over the last couple of uh, episodes, we were talking to uh, people who are running the place, essentially uh, municipal and provincial and federal government uh, at all of those levels. We had uh, Mark Grimes on, Christine Hogarth, and of course, uh, John Maloney joined us. Uh, All of them to talk about this community specifically. And uh, as, as we do this, we're starting to see glimmers of positivity, certainly uh, if not in, in the news, amongst ourselves. And so uh, Roger got in touch with me last night and said, look, I, I have an amazing story and I think we should put it out there. And that's what we're doing today. So it's not exactly a, a full length podcast, but we wanted to make an introduction in the community uh, to you of somebody that's really making a difference. Talk to me, Roger. Yeah, absolutely. And just to go back about what you said, yeah, we had uh, representatives from all three levels of government. Um, but just to touch on something that James Maloney said, he's the member of parliament for Etobicoke Lakeshore. He said, you know, think of other people. And when you think of other people, you think of yourself, but, you know, consider others through all of this. And and that kind of inspired me to reach out to Stu Bailey. And, and Stu is a new Toronto resident who is going above and beyond. He's answering the call to help others and to think of others. And uh, I think it's uh, probably going to be best to hear from him what he's doing. But I I think that uh, he's a real inspiration uh, to me and hopefully to our listeners as well. Um, Anyone can can help out in your own little way. And uh, we're all in this together. Stu, thanks for joining us. Morning, guys. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, this is a delight. Uh, it is um, uh, odd times. You're a business guy. You you uh, you have your own business in the uh, in the South Etobicoke area. You're uh, uh, you are widely known and uh, quite beloved by our friend Roger here. But last <laughs> night he uh, he got in touch with me and he said, "You're not going to believe what this guy Stuart Bailey is doing." I said, "What?" He said, "He's actually creating stuff uh, that will make a difference." Tell us first of all, what do you do normally with your days? What's your day job? Uh, normally, uh, well, first, I, first things first. I, I'm I'm visiting you here from uh, you know from Seventh Street in New Toronto. Uh, what I like to remind myself is Treaty Land, uh, Treaty Thirteen, uh, with the Mississaugas, the New Credit First Nation, and uh, I've been carrying the torch. I think of New Toronto making for a long time. Um, it's uh, it's a it's a rich history in this in this neighborhood going over a hundred years and we'll get into some of that in a bit. But my day job, I'm an information scientist, so I'm a nerd. Uh, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm trained in library and information science, and I work with records and information, kind of IT stuff. Okay. Uh, I do privacy. I do uh, help people figure out what they do with information, how they make sense. Of, of information, usually with larger corporate settings, but um, it, it could it can even be smaller stuff. But uh, my hobby, uh, which I, I do also do as a, a small business, is New Toronto Makeshore. And so New Toronto Makeshore is what I call Toronto's smallest makerspace. There are a bunch of makerspaces throughout the city. And uh, well, what's a makerspace, Stu? So maker a makerspace is uh, a type of an organization there are a lot of different ways that you can set one up and run one but generally speaking it is uh, a place where people can go and create things some places focus on lasers some places focus on electronics or coding or um you know minecraft games some places focus on 3d printing woodworking there's a really wide range of different types of skills and organizations um, throughout, you know, throughout the globe. 
Uh, but generally speaking, a makerspace is, is just um, a place where people can go and be creative and make things. Okay, so really, if, if, I have a really desi- if I have a desire to make something but don't have all, all the tool set that I would require and don't want to put that investment into doing it and maybe don't have the mentorship around me to complete the project, I could go to a makerspace and there are some people there that already are making stuff. The tool sets might be there. The uh, um, I guess a little bit of networking to, to complete your project. That's, ac- yeah, absolutely accurate. That's, that's totally what it is. It's Very a community... Cool community driven type of an organization where people uh, who want to create and help others come together and, and work on stuff and, and help share knowledge and learn new skills and, and create things. What does your makerspace uh, focus on? Uh, so in, in my makerspace, which is really mostly just me in my basement, um, I do 3D printing. I've done a bunch of little free libraries. Uh, I have. Oh, uh, I love those. Th- those are in the community here. where you can go and you can uh, uh, people donate books. You can uh, share that sort of stuff. That's it. Oh, yeah, I love those. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so I, I have a, a, a training as a, an information science. So that's library science. So I, I am trained as a librarian and uh, I, I live on a street that leads down to the lake. So I'm effectively on Islington uh, and they're I, I noticed there are lots of foot traffic, you know, going people going down to, to hang out at the park down at the lake. But as soon as I put in my little free library, I instantly started connecting with more of my neighbors. Uh, it really surprised me uh, because I, I think I'm a fairly congenial guy. I like to talk to people and say hi. Uh, but as soon as I put that in, th- there was a ripple effect. And, and it's like turning a light on. Um, I, I have to admit that it was partially self-serving. I had too many books on my shelves. And so I wanted to get rid of them, but I didn't want to just dump them. So I thought making a little free library and putting it at the bottom of, of my driveway would be one way that I could, uh, uh, commu- you know, connect with the community and and uh, and help enrich uh, the nice. lives of others. I like that. And it's always got something in it. It's got a real Euro feel to it. I notice them a lot in Europe when I'm traveling there. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now you've got this maker space and uh, we're all locked up uh, trying to be good citizens and, and stop the spread of this uh, nasty virus here. Uh, and, uh, you gotta, there's you, there's a 3d printer. There's you, there's a 3d printer. You must be like, Oh, I'm going to be making some stuff. And then you had an inspiration. Tell us about this. Well, um, I am lucky enough to be connected with a community of makers in Toronto. Uh, back in February, uh, I was fortunate enough to participate in a maker unconference. Uh, so this was February 1st and 2nd. This was run by the good folks who do the Maker Festival. Uh, so my friend Jen Dodd reached out and, and they invited, uh, they, they asked for, for people to come over. And an unconference, if you don't know what it is, an unconference is a, 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 it's like a conference, but there's no schedule. So what happened is there were about 200 people, 200 makers. Uh, these are teachers, librarians, um, engineers, people who run makerspaces from south on, mostly southern Ontario, um, kind of as far out as Guelph, uh, around the Toronto area. And we came together and we were looking at this unconference of what, what do we want to do? And the unconference format is you show up and then everybody figures out what you want to talk about. Cool. And what we were talking about was where, where is the maker movement going? What do we want to do? And out of that um, conference, um, we had a number of ideas that came out, and it really was an important backdrop to what happened about a week and a half ago or two weeks ago when everything changed. Because it gave me a frame of reference to think about how can I actually pivot? Uh, how can I uh, enrich what I'm doing? How can I change? How, you know, as a small business owner, you always have to be ready to grow. You know, have to be ready to, you know, uh, make a change and see a new opportunity. So when this happened, I was sitting around. I had already been in touch with a number of people, and I saw things start to light up. I saw people on LinkedIn. I saw people on Twitter. I saw people on um, Instagram starting to say, Hey, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm doing this. And thankfully the community of makers are, you know, always willing to share. So I started to see a number of, uh, different face shield models. There were a few different things that were showing up first. So the call for personal protective equipment, I think there are about three or four different things. There's the N 
95 masks, which are the masks that actually prevent aspiration coming out of you and going into somebody else um, or keeping it from coming into your, you know, into your mouth. Uh, there are face shields, there were gowns, and then there were rubber gloves, uh, latex gloves. And I looked at the masks and I thought, I can't fabricate something like that. I'm not, it, there are some really high um, rigorous testing and, and requirements that are needed for that sort of thing. And that's not something that I'm set up to do. Uh, the gowns, obviously, I'm not going to make those. Uh, latex gloves, I don't really have that many. I've got a couple, but not a, not a big supply. But then I looked at the face shields and I thought, hey, that's something that I could probably do. So there are a few different models that were floating around. And anybody who is a creator or a maker, or even if you work in you know software design or whatever, you got it. You know that you have to iterate, iterate, iterate. So build, test, break, repeat until you get something that works. So for the first um, I guess maybe the first few days, first week almost, uh, I was looking around, finding some of the different models. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy named uh, Peter Lau, who's with MakerWiz. He had a model and, and I, I was uh, running that through my machines, trying to figure out how I get the, the tolerances right and the settings correct. Uh, the folks at Shop3D had another model. Uh, there was an early model out um, that was organized through Prusa, which is a, they're a manufacturer and they were working with doctors in the Czech Republic uh, and they had a model. So I had three or four different models that I, that I was looking at. And then I came across another one uh, that was through the PPE drive. Uh, and that was a call out. That was the first major call out from the Michael Guerin hospital. And a guy uh, by the name of Sean Lim had another design there. So I had about three or four different models that I was working with to see what one prints best. And I don't know if you can hear it in the background. I've got a, yeah. a couple of printers going right now. I can hear that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's just uh, it's it's small scale manufacturing, but uh, I'm just getting as many up and out uh, how as many quickly you, as I can. How many have you made, Stu? Uh, I've made, uh, including the ones that failed, I've made probably about two dozen. So, uh, I had to have some, you know, obviously I, I don't want to ship something that I wouldn't use. Right. Uh, so if it's poor quality, then it, it doesn't go out the door. Um, but once I went through all my tolerances and sort of dialed in the settings, I started to be able to produce, uh, some that are fairly stable quality and that you can put on and, the, and that you can use. So I think I've shipped right now, maybe two dozen. Who'd you send them by, to? The first ones that I took, um, were actually up to the Lakeshore village walk-in clinic, just up the street from me. I was intending to drop these off as part of the community make, uh, initiative, uh, to bring everything into a central hub and then they're distributing them to the hospitals and stuff. But before I did that, I thought I'll, I'll bet that there's somebody in the neighborhood yeah. who might be able to use these. And so I walked up and, and stood at a distance, called the receptionist from right outside the door and, and said, hi, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm making these things. Is the doctor available there? And so the doctor came out and uh, doctor, I believe her name is Dr. Kashani. She showed me, the you know the quick thing that she had made from a headband and uh it was a, a clear plastic sheet that she she'd received at a conference just a handout of, at a conference and she said well the problem with this is you know it's sliding off my face i can't i can't use it and i said well i've made these could they be of use to you and she said uh, she said yeah actually they probably couldn't she said how much do you how much do you charge for them and i said well i'm not going to charge anything for these i'm going to give them to you uh, because you're doing you know, you're doing the heavy work. Yeah. I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy with a printer. What was right? her response? <laughs> what was her response to your uh, kindness? She was very grateful. Uh, she said, yes, we could use these. And I said, do you need any more? And she said, yeah. So I supplied them with, um, about half a dozen face shields. And what I'm making is, uh, it's like the headband. So, uh, it's the piece that goes on your head. And then, uh, in our, in our home office, we ended up having a, a stockpile of, uh, I don't know, for, for those of you who are of my age, you'll remember overheads in school. Oh, yeah. So there's a transparent sheet. It's just a, you know, it's just a plastic sheet that is, uh, you know, everybody right. can hear that. And you remember your, 
your teachers writing on that um, and, and then projecting they, it on My teachers would turn away and I would draw a little rude picture and they'd turn back and there it was on the screen. Yeah, I remember those. That's right. So yeah. that is, it's, I don't know that it's medical grade or not. I'm not a virologist or an epidemiologist. But it is, but it's, but it's a film between you and the potential uh, infection, the virus. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, and at this point, at this point, where I think everybody is like, what works? Does it work? Can we do it? Can we make it? Yeah. Can we ship it? Right. And so that's the focus. So I, I um, put together these masks, took them up to the, to the doctor and said, does these work? She said, yes. Then I went over to, uh, the pharmacy, the Shoppers Drug Mart, at Lakeshore and Fifth, and I said I had to mail something, and and I asked the the workers in the post office. I said, is this something that you might be able to use? And they said yes. The pharmacists were far enough back, right? From they they have some some shield set up, so they said no, we don't need them. But uh, uh, so I'm going to continue to to produce them and and see if I can hand them out to people who might need them in uh, in the neighborhood. But I also did take up uh, a small shipment up to this community make collective. Uh, so that's up at the Maker Bean Cafe, which is where I dropped that off. And that's Bloor and, and uh, around Bloor and uh, Dufferin area. Yeah. Uh, and from there, then this is where I connect with a bunch of other makers in the, in the community. And uh, then they get collected. And then from there, they'll, they'll go on to, uh, to other, you know, whoever needs them. I'll tell you something, Roger, you're connected to some cool people because over the last few days, the amount of effort that I'm seeing uh, coming out of this community, it's uh, it's really, it's, it's a joyful thing at a time where we're all in a, a state of anxiety and panic that people are trying to protect one another. Uh, Stu's a great example of this. By the way, I've never wanted a 3D printer more in my whole life than I do right now. <laughs> well, uh, we keep hearing it on these podcasts, right, Mike? People talk about Etobicoke Lakeshore. And it's a special place. And that's kind of been one of the driving forces behind the magazine over the past five years is to try to understand why that is. Um, and I think by and large, it's because of the people who live there. And Stu's a great example yeah. of, that, of this. Yeah, it's so amazing. Like, what a great place. <laughs> what a great place. To, I, I'm delighted my studio's there because I get to hang out in that neighborhood. But to live there is a special thing because people are looking out for each other. It, it is a special place and we're really fortunate. We keep, we keep telling ourselves how lucky we are. Um, I, I've been coming to this neighborhood since the mid eighties and uncle who bought to uh, have an uncle who bought a place on ninth street. So I've been coming to the neighborhood since uh, around the mid eighties, but then we moved in uh, about 14 years ago. And recently I was doing a little bit of um, a little bit of research on this neighborhood in particular on new Toronto and uh, I found out that um, thanks to the work uh, by Robert A. Given and the Etobicoke Historical Society, so I was looking at etobicohistorical.com, and uh, at one point in time, New Toronto boasted the highest value of manufacturing per square mile in North America. So New Toronto is actually, uh, it started in around 1890 as a, a growing suburb of Toronto. And by 1920, so we're 100 years old this year by charter, I believe. Um, but some of the businesses that, that have been here include well, a wallpaper uh, factory that, that became the Dominion Color Corporation, which is, I believe, still at, um, on New Toronto Street. Uh, there was early real estate, stamping and boiler making machinery there was a foundry making furnaces boilers uh, chandeliers barbed wire brass works for plumbing and engineering there's an interior wood decorating there was a um, uh, paper manufacturers there was dupont did rubber coated cotton for uh it was like car tops so that it was uh, impervious to the weather there was a tannery there was a water supply obviously campbell's soup continental can there was the mental health, um, the asylum, what they called it, it um, which is now uh, the Humber, um, the Humber campus. Uh, there was even a New Toronto Oil and Natural Gas Company, uh, where they they were um, getting natural gas and oil out of the out of the ground here. And then, of course, Goodyear. Uh, so New Toronto, in fact, has a long history of of people making things and people making things. Um, not only for the neighborhood, but for the continent. And so I'm, I found when I started New Toronto Make Sure in about 2014, 
um, I was really inspired by that. We're, we're, we're the kind of neighborhood where people have a little bit of, you know, we got a little bit of grit underneath our fingernails. Yeah, a bit of ingenuity, um, right? Like, I mean, yeah. and, and, and uh, if you're part of a community that will support that, then cool things get made, it seems. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's another really great point, Mike. Um, and I have really tapped into that, that there is a good, strong sense of community here where people do look out for each other. Um, we are practicing the physical distancing. We are trying to keep, you know, that distance between ourselves and, and others. Um, but as I walk around, I walk the dog, um, you know, people are close by. We're asking each other, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? We're looking at each other in yeah. the eye and checking up on our neighbors. Well, listen, I, uh, I'm inspired by what you're doing there. Uh, that you started in the community and said, "Hey, look, can I can I lend a hand to you specifically for this?" Uh, and and went to the the local uh, medical center, then went to the the local pharmacy to to help protect your actual neighbors. Uh, I think is really special that you're creating something that you could create more of and uh, protect people just because you wanted to help is really cool. Hey, let's promote the uh, <clears throat> let's promote your your makers. Uh, uh, sorry, it's called a makers. What, how, how do you call it? <laughs> yeah, it's a, typically it's called a, a makerspace. A makerspace. So, That's what I wanted to say, makerspace. Roger. Did That's you, right. Yeah. I, hey, Roger, don't look at me that way. I'm a professional broadcaster. I know words. <laughs> makerspace. Stu, thank you for joining us. If people wanted to find out more about your makerspace, where could they do that? Uh, you can go to neutrontomakesure.ca. N-E-W-T-O-R-O-N-T-O-M-A-K-E-S-H-O-R-E. Make sure... Thanks, Stu. Keep it up, man. You're a good neighbor. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Stu. Appreciate Stay it. Stay safe, guys. You so there, there you go, Roger. Like you, you really do have an eye for finding people in the neighborhood doing cool stuff. So what Stu is doing, I think, is his version of what almost all of us could do in some way, whether it's donate to the food bank or, you know, create uh, something that's going to keep people safe or even if it's just as he points out keeping social distance at the moment it's it's a responsibility and it's not that difficult is it no it's not you You're know right. i mean granted making face shields off a 3d printer takes more skill than say you know just social distancing but you know what we're asked to do right now is not that hard we just need to stay home i mean basically we're we're being asked to do the easiest possible thing which is sit in your couch and watch tv and there's Stu. He he actually said, "I'm not going to do TV. I got a cool printer over here, and I've got some. Yeah. I stole some uh, overhead slides when I was back in high school. I'm going to make a difference here. I'm not saying, <laughs> by the way, he stole those in high school, but I have a stack someplace. I'm sure. Yeah, I used to. Uh, <laughs> uh, listen, subscribe to the podcast. We're going to have more great guests. We'll keep you connected to one another as best we can through the podcast. Uh, share it with a friend and neighbor. We'd appreciate that. Roger Tumanuri, you're one of my favorite guys. I'm glad you're safe and sound, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike.